Welcome to Race, Accountability, and Allyship at Brown. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This, tonight's teaching is part of the Transformative Conversations Project. Transformative Conversations, housed in the Office of Institutional Diversity, encourages members of Brown's community to engage respectfully and thoughtfully with each other across our differences. Over the course of its first semester, this project has included a series of teach-ins, lectures, and seminars, and events. While recent teach-ins have focused on incidents in the external world, like Ferguson and Gaza, we wanted to have a conversation about social justice on Brown's campus. One of the goals of Transformative Conversations is to allow us to consider our personal experiences as we collectively create a respectful, just, and inclusive community at Brown. In the spirit of these personal reflections, Kaylee and I will each share with you a brief explanation as why we as white students are interested in discussing race, accountability, and allyship on Brown's campus. My name is Kaylee and I grew up in Boston. <clears throat> I went to public schools and my friends who weren't white experienced things that I never had to go through. When I came to Brown and took my first Africana class, um, I realized that the inequalities I witnessed growing up were not unique to my school. It was scary for me to learn about, but what scared me more was the fact that I hadn't known and that if I wanted to, I never had to know. It's hard for me to talk about the fact that I receive privileges in society based on my skin color, but it's necessary. I've grown up in a society that normalizes whiteness and uses stereotypes to justify racial inequalities. I don't blame myself for absorbing these ideas, but it's important for me to identify biases I have, think about how I've learned them, educate myself, and work to unlearn them. It's my responsibility as a white person to listen as much as possible, to learn as much as possible, and with that knowledge, challenge inequality in the spaces that I occupy. My name is Hannah, and I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, during SP 1070, the Show Me Your Papers immigration legislation. I grew up hearing and thinking about race, but as a white person in a mostly white neighborhood, racial inequity was something theoretical and something policy specific. When I came to Brown, I took Professor Hamlin's class on the black freedom struggle and participated in a spring break research project at Tougaloo College, historically black college in Jackson, Mississippi. Spending time at Tougaloo while I was sim simultaneously studying the long history of racial oppression in America, seeing my friends, peers, and teachers experience racial injustice on a fundamentally different level forced me to consider how, as a white student, I not only profited from this inequity, but that unless I spoke up, there was no compulsion requiring me to reckon with how I was involved or how I profited from the system. Upon my return, I did not want my silence to be understood as complicity. The Transformative Conversations Project was created with the belief that progress comes through the recognition of our individual privileges, of our history, and of our responsibilities. You may notice that everyone on the panel is white. This is intentional. Uh, we want to use this teaching as a starting point to recognize the privileges of our panelists and the various positions of power and influence they occupy. We see this teaching as an opportunity to enter an ongoing conversation about the role of white community members in furthering racial justice. This conversation begins with collective recognition. We have asked our esteemed panelists and moderators to offer us merely a starting place, just a reflection on their own experiences and their own privilege. And we hope that this starting place prompts more conversations that lead to actions and commitments undertaken by students, faculty, staff, and administrators alike. Now we would like to take a moment to introduce our co-moderators. Shane Lloyd is an assistant director at Brown Center for Students of Color. Shane is... <laughs> <laughs> Shane is joined by Dean Gail Coey, director of <laughs> Director of the Sarah Doyle Women's Center and Assistant Dean of the College. We would like to thank our co-moderators very much for all their support in making this program possible. 
Before we begin with the questions, we would like to ask our co-moderators and each of our panelists what brought them to this conversation and to this panel. After the moderated discussion, we will open the dialogue to Q&A from our audience members, so write down any questions if they pop up and we'll collect them at the end. After the panel, we hope you join us in the lobby for pizza and informal discussion. Thank you. Thank you. First, I'd like to say thank you to Kaylee and Hannah for providing us with this awesome opportunity to get together and have this conversation. I would just like to start with, let's just pull the Band-Aid. I am nervous. I am sure my colleagues are also nervous. <laughs> I'm sure all of you are also nervous. <laughs> and, and we're also really excited, and this is a necessary, critical, and important conversation that needs to be had right now. Because I think for myself, as one black man at this institution, if I, there are only three, if anyone takes a look at the gilded frames across the institution, they're in Sales Hall, the John Hay Library, the Rock, and across various spaces, the Faculty Club. To date, as far as I know, there are only three gilded frames that feature the images of black men. There's Jay Saunders Redding, Samuel M. Nabrit, and then there's Emin Page, who was the first black graduate of Brown. And that is significant to me because what that says is, who are the other faces in the many gilded frames that are across this institution? And when I think of conversations around race, I think about how we have to engage in conversations around white institutional presence and how whiteness is not invisible and it also does not necessarily need to be normalized. And we need to engage in that conversation and grapple with our identities as individuals but also as an institution of Brown. And as we're celebrating 250 years of history here at this institution, we have to grapple with the changing faces of this institution and to what degree the student population but also the faculty, staff, and administration reflect the diversity that is coming um, into fruition and realization. Moreover, I think it's also important that we reconcile with the difficulty and fear around having these conversations. And if we are truly committed to being actively anti-racist, well, everyone has to be committed to be actively anti-racist because passive anti-racism just doesn't exist. <laughs> and that is, that's just a plain fact. Um, <clears throat> So to get to why I'm most excited about this conversation is because I know that I think back to the convocation remarks that Provost Colvin delivered, and she talked about how, you know, this is the most diverse class ever. 40% of you are minorities. And I thought, okay, well, what does that mean for the 60%? Like, what, is, what, what does that actually mean? Where do they go to have conversations to interrogate their identity? Where do they have opportunities to come together as white students to say, you know what, I'm coming to a consciousness about this racist world that we live in and I'm trying to figure out where to act. Where can they find role models for people who are also struggling with an otherwise difficult conversation? I sit in the Brown Center for Students of Color. The centrality of our work is around race. But just because I live the racial experience of a black man and just because I talk about these topics and think about these topics intellectually, theoretically, and through my lived experience every day does not mean that these conversations are easy. No matter what stage in your own personal development with regard to these conversations, these conversations are going to continue to be difficult. And I ask all of you to engage with that difficulty from whatever position you sit in. And um, to close my remarks, I'll actually share a quote that I got from Professor Rose's commentary at the end of the Ferguson teaching when, some, when a student asked her, well, what's the role of white students? I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But she said, you know, it's really important that we remember that anti-racist consciousness can happen in any racially ascribed body. And I thought that was a really critical and poignant statement because at the end of the day, we are all racialized within this world, whether we're white, black, Hispanic, Asian, and we need to grapple with that racialized identity and begin the active work of dismantling these systems. So that is why I am nervous, excited, and absolutely delighted at the presence of all of you, and I look forward to co-moderating with Dean Kohi and delivering a presentation that not only provides you with something that can ground your thinking about race, but also provides you with leadership and comfort and willingness to engage in this difficult conversation and this struggle, because it is an ongoing one. I wanted to follow Shane because I knew he would say a lot of what needed to be said and then I wouldn't have to say things, so I'm going to probably say less, but I also am nervous. Uh, even though I have this conversation, it seems like all the time. I know how difficult this is, and this is a big group of people, so it's really a wonderful, um, 
It's wonderful that so many people came and so many people are interested and we can actually have this conversation. I want to thank the students who uh, organized this. I'm going to go back to a little bit of what they were saying, Hannah and Kaylee, that I, um, I was born the same year. This is going to date me, so you can all look this up really fast. Uh, the same year as Brown versus Board of Education. And I grew up in Delaware, which was one of the states that uh, was under, under the federal gun. And so I grew up at a time that I watched my public school, which was in a really under-resourced area, as we say now, integrate. And so it integrated slowly, and it integrated badly, and then it integrated very quickly and very badly. And so race was always, race, racism, and white supremacy was always in the periphery of my vision, if not always directly. And one thing I want to say about my own work is that one thing I always did was pay attention. And so I feel like I've been pay, paying attention for a long time and learning everything I can. And anti-racist work is really central to my own work in the Women's Center and certainly my work in the classroom. And so I'm really thrilled to be here and um, I'm so happy to get to do this with Shane, who's a wonderful moderator. Um, but it has to be central to all of our work and when the kind of feminism we practice at the Sarah Doyle Women's Center is absolutely intersectional and is never anything but intersectional. So I hope you find that one of the places you can come have these conversations. So now we're gonna to transition to each of the panelists describing how they came into this conversation. And I will be holding time, so. <laughs> Apologies if I interrupt. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I was wondering where I would sit. Um, so my name is Michael Kennedy. I'm a professor of sociology and international studies here. Any sociologist should be really happy, even if nervous, to participate in this panel. And that's because our discipline is organized around questions of power, difference, and inequality. Sociology should be at the center of this kind of conversation. Personally, I'm quite white. <laughs> and I come from a quite white place, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. My scholarship looks quite white, too. Most of my work was in Poland in the beginning and I focused on, quote unquote, globalizing knowledge. I have a book coming out soon. <laughs> I am known for cheap plugs. <laughs> but it was my work on that book that drew me back to my originating interest in sociology. In that quite white Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, in the mid-1970s, I led my senior high school class in a discussion of under what conditions the Black Panther movement was an exemplar for democracy's extension. How that quite white guy in that quite white place imagined that question, I don't know. But I come back to it now because my interest in the sociology of universities demands it. There is no way for us to think about the good university without thinking about the whiteness of universities. There's no way for us to think about open conversation without thinking about the constraints on conversation. And when I think about the constraints on conversation, I don't mean interruptions of presentations. I mean the ways in which different rules and resources shape what is privileged in conversation and what is not. One of the things that makes me proud of being a sociologist is that I have colleagues like this, who write, book, write books that talk about colorblind racism, that talk about structural racism, that talk about the search to identify racism's parameters in ways that don't just go to how crude or ignorant an individual might be, but rather how the system of rules and resources privileges some groups over others. 
There is no question that in America, white privilege defines power even in an era with a black president. But it also means that we have to think about how this racism works in ever more sophisticated ways. And I thought about this mainly as an issue for America at large. Because when I came from Brown, came to Brown from the University of Michigan, I am ending. <laughs> That might be a good time to stop, but I will end with this point. I thought that I was coming to a place that actually had thought through diversity much better than Michigan. And I don't think it has. And the reason I don't think it has is because I never had at Michigan someone come up to me and say, I don't think I belong here. I have had way too many colleagues and friends of color come up to me and say, I don't think I belong here. And so for me, when I heard those expressions, I didn't think I belonged here either. And so I want to belong here, and I want everyone to belong here. And that's why I'm on this panel. Good evening, I'm Margaret Clawoon. I'm the Vice President for Campus Life and Student Services at Brown. And it was actually my interests in race, class, gender, sexual identity, religious identity, disability, and other differences that brought me into higher education administration. My first administrative position was as a coordinator of a comprehensive multicultural initiative because I was interested in how universities th think structurally, and by that I mean hiring and curricular initiatives innovation and interpersonally the student programming and the faculty staff workshops about diversity and so I remain committed to those efforts in terms of how we do this work as a university. I came to that work out of my own experience of feminism having taken the first women's studies course at my college and I started to think as I was writing this out in kind of three sections so you'll hear them this first one is finding the language and then language to action and finally don't get stuck in guilt. So I'll start with finding the language. Reading feminist writers like Adrienne Rich, whose formulation of patriarchy was so powerful, opened my mind to a realm of understanding. And I'm thinking of poems like Diving Into the Wreck. And if you don't know that poem, go look for it. Because the poetic speaker there is described as the mermaid, the merman, diving into the wreck, looking for the thing itself, and finding a book of myths in which our names do not appear. Rich's insight that language reflected patriarchal ideology was so influential to me because of my interest in literature and led to an intellectual commitment to feminism and then into action. It was my intellectual challenge to patriarchal structures that then led to protests. I got involved in abortion rights, which was a natural next step. Then anti-nuclear protests became relevant because I began to think about how we care for our environment and applying those same values. Um, to those issues, and then divestment into South Africa, which was a really hot issue on campuses at the time. So global human rights then became important. So there was a progression of working out my commitments in the world and to the world that stemmed from having a way to analyze patriarchy. And then I shift into language to action, because these conversations about feminism, I'm talking about the late 70s and the early 80s, were very heated conversations between white women and women of color. So so what was really exciting and stimulating was to be in these conversations as a student and with my friends and, and, and peers, but also having voices like Audre Lorde's and books like this bridge called My Back that were so essential. So what was really exciting is feminists in print were having dialogue with each other and challenging each other. So Audre Lorde publishes her letter to Mary Daly, who's white, challenging Daly to see that the oppression of women knows no racial or ethnic boundaries, true, but that does not mean it is identical within those differences. So that kind of formulation where we could begin to think about and talk about how do we understand one oppression in relation to another was really important. Lord also formulated the idea of talking across differences. And that's a formulation that I try never to forget, that we're always talking across differences, not around them or as if they don't exist. 
So feminism gave me words to understand my experience, and I began to see both my relationship to oppression as a woman and the places where I had privilege as a white, middle-class, heterosexual woman. I grew up in the moment of the Equal Rights Amendment, and conversations about women's equality were everywhere. In junior high, I wanted to be on the track team. There was no girls track team, but by the time I got to high school, Title IX had made that a possibility. I was the first woman in my family to attend college. That fact alone, being the first female to attend college in my family, reflects both the sexism that belonged to my family and the privilege that was now given to me. There were new possibilities, but also the responsibility about how to make the best use of those opportunities. And the last section, don't get stuck in guilt, is um, Finding Peggy McIntosh's explication, which is in the packet that you received of white privilege in her essay, The Invisible Knapsack, was very significant for her exhortation to do something with your privilege. If you have unearned advantage, then do something positive with it. She really helped to formulate for white people trying to think through this work how to get out from under denial and guilt and challenge ourselves to take responsibility. That challenge continues to be important to me, and I began the practice of doing the work, which included learning how to redo the work, how to go back to a conversation that didn't go right the first time, or an interaction that wasn't successful, and go back and do it again, or try it again at a different space. I really liked one of the other resources that Hannah and Kaylee pointed us to was um, Jay Smooth, and I really liked his formulation that you have to do anti-prejudice work like you do dental hygiene. You have to do it every day, like brushing your teeth. You're not done with prejudice. My commitment is to seeing if my presence and effort in anti-racist work can open up possibilities and spaces for others if I'm willing to step into the work and acknowledge my own relationship to racism and systems of privilege as a white woman. So, and I want to thank Hannah and Kaylee for doing the work to organize this event and the careful preparation. So thank you. Good evening, my name is Ken Miller. I'm a professor of biology here at Brown. Uh, I grew up in Rahway, New Jersey, which is a, uh, um, actually people from Westfield and Scotch Plains step aside when I mention <laughs> Rahway usually, um, which is a, a, a racially mixed town, probably about 30% black when I grew up there, uh, now an equal proportion Latino. Um, it had a single high school, a single YMCA, a single set of athletic facilities. Uh, growing up, um, my teammates, my classmates were black. I had black teachers. I had black coaches. Saw people in positions of authority. Um, thought that was pretty normal. Um, I came to Brown because I was awarded an Alfred P. Sloan National Scholarship, which paid my tuition, which my family could not possibly have afforded to study science. When I arrived on this campus in the fall of 1966, and that'll tell you exactly how old I am, this was the whitest place I had ever seen in my life. And I can, in fact, tell you that I am personally, on a first name basis, with every single African American member of the Brown class of 1970. They are Seymour James, Phil Lord, and Hal Bailey. That's it. <laughs> That's how white this place was. Uh, when I came here, because I'd always kind of had an interest in teaching as well, I looked around campus to see what volunteer opportunities there were, and there was something called the Lippitt Hill Tutorial. Many of you may not know that we are right next to, to Lippitt Hill, which is that away. Uh, it's, there was an old beat up school about a block and a half to the north of where the MLK school, elementary school is right now. Um, that was the school in which I volunteered to tutor students. It was 100% African American, and it gave me an insight into the obstacles that people of color faced uh, growing up in Providence and also in the Providence public schools. Um, I. When I finished here, I earned my PhD, um, taught at a, another school, which I will not mention, but it's in the same athletic conference that we are, and it's near Boston. Um, <laughs> was delighted to come back uh, to my undergraduate alma mater, have taught introductory biology, and have been absolutely delighted, uh, was delighted from 1980 when I first showed up, to see the change in the multiple complexions of the student body, to see the diversity of thought on this campus and the diversity of backgrounds. Um, 
for uh, many of you in this room may not know it, but probably a third to half of you used a biology textbook that I wrote when you were in high school. So I've already had an awful influences on your life, even if you've never taken a course from me. But I do teach a large introductory level biology course in the spring. And during my career at Brown, my best estimate is that I have taught about 14,000 students. And that's given me a chance basically to do what I came here to do and what I love to do, which is to be an evangelist for science. And that evangelism spreads across all the ethnic and racial groups on campus. And I'll tell you one quick anecdote. that This goes back about 15 years ago. There was some discussion on campus at the time that the odds of getting into this university, if you were of Asian ancestry, were much lower than if you were white. And the suggestion was made in no uncertain terms to the admissions office that perhaps they had a quota on Asian Americans, or perhaps they were prejudiced or discriminating against them and so forth. And what came back from the admissions office at the time, not the current director of admissions, by the way, I want to make that clear, what came back from the admissions office was, oh no, we don't discriminate against Asian Americans. It's just that way too many of them are interested in science, and we want students who are more broadly interested in learning. Boy, did that perk up our ears uh, within biology and medicine, because the definition of someone who's interested in science as narrow uh, immediately rubbed all of us the wrong way, and we made it very clear we had encounters with the admissions office. We want to teach bright, inquisitive kids, and darn it, if lots of them are of a dif different ethnic origin than you think they should be, forget that. Give us those smart kids so we can teach them. And that's always been my attitude at Brown, and it's one of the reasons I've been delighted to be here ever since I first set foot on this campus. Thanks a lot, and thanks for coming. Well, thanks, Ken. A lot of that sounds familiar, actually. Uh, <laughs> I'm really nervous because I'm an engineer. And, uh, <laughs> we're not used to reading that kind of things and all that. There's a question here about... Uh, <laughs> Microaggressions in the classroom. Well, in my courses, there isn't any microaggressions, and uh, I think it reflects sort of the subject uh, that, that I, I, I'm interested in. Uh, I think I'm here because a long time ago, uh, I was uh, heavily involved in the uh, what those days was called the transitional. Uh, program. It's now whatever, TV. I, I can't forget. Lots of T's and W's in there. Uh, and and uh, uh, again, was very nervous about how this was going to be. And, and the reason, of course, I was there is just because of what Ken said. Uh, the number of uh, African Americans or minorities in general, uh, Latinos, were absolutely invisible, as far as I could tell. Uh, let's just put it this way: uh, half the minority students at Brown were involved in that program, uh, you, you know, as, as teachers, instructors, uh, den mothers, and, and and all that kind of thing. So you can imagine what the the place was like, and you know, being. Uh, what as I am was quite nervous about it, and somebody in the mission office took me, uh, an African American person in the mission office took me aside and said, the most important thing is to let people know that they're welcome at Brown. And I think that's very good advice, and, and uh, I worked in the dean's office for uh, many years, and came away realizing that about half the students at Brown uh, don't think they belong here, or come in and say, gee, the admission office made a mistake in admitting me, and I'm not really good enough for this place, or I got admitted because of, and then you can think of all things, my parents, uh, I guess my race, and something like that. And uh, I, I hope it's clear that, that, that the pro problem, at least in those days, was to make uh, people who were somewhat different feel that they were really part of the community. And I worry that we don't do enough of that now. That, that uh, uh, in an uh, effort to treat everybody equally, I don't think we're meeting the needs of a whole lot of people. Uh, 
I think the other thing I got from that experience was um, a concern uh, that a minority person on the one hand is a person, but on the other hand, a minority person is a representative, so to speak. Uh, uh, you don't hear it so much anymore. You heard a lot then, you know, what do you people want? And, and, and uh, I think we have to be very careful uh, not to uh, expect an individual minority person to, in some sense, represent the, uh, the, the, well, the whole race and all that. Uh, sorry, I didn't push. Uh, and and uh, I, th I think finally, uh, in those days, I was quite convinced that things were going to get better, and, and certainly, you know, 50 years, 50 years, everybody would be sort of the same, and everybody would feel very comfortable with Brown, and we wouldn't have discussions of race. And I'm really worried that that, that didn't happen. And uh, what I'm afraid of, it's sort of like the uh, uh, <coughs> person who was the drug czar who said the battle's won and we don't have to worry anymore. I don't know if the battle's won at all. And, and I th th think we have to uh, consciously find opportunities like this to talk about race and to talk about uh, justice. <laughs> Uh, first, thank you so much for inviting me to be on this panel. I think the reason, my name is Don King, and I'm a visiting assistant professor in environmental studies, and I, I think the reason why I was asked to be on this panel is because I, well, you talk about this stuff in class all the time. Um, and I, I do because I have to, and, there, and, and there's a few reasons why I have to talk about this in my classes. And the first reason uh, is that I constantly find myself apologizing on the first days of class, especially my intro environmental studies class, where I say, I'm so sorry that the next set of readings for two weeks are going to be a bunch of dead white guys, and there's nothing I could do about it. They were the only ones writing about environment at this time, and purposefully interjecting females and people of color, uh, trying to pull them into the discussion. And from day one, I, I, I apologize and say, you know, there's a very missing perspective here. And I tell them the story about uh, the urban conservative conservation split and environmentalism. There's the green environmentalism, which is save the trees, save the rainforest, save the critters. And then there's urban environmental policy, which is toxins and environmental justice that for so many years was completely and totally ignored. And there was a, a moment, uh, reading some Alice Hamilton, and she did, um, a, a lot of us claim her as our own, um, a sociologist, uh, epidemiologist. Uh, uh, I, I try to claim her as a political scientist as well, and certainly an environmental scholar where she was uh, one of the few women in Chicago at the Hamilton uh, uh, teaching about going into immigrant communities. And this is back in the late 1800s. And she was trying to figure out you know, some of the causes of lead poisoning and mercury poisoning. And she was going into these immigrant communities and she was trying to make this argument. You guys don't get it. It's, it's about, at the time it was Italians and a lot of European immigrants. And she was trying to convince the many, many men around her um, that it's not because poor people don't wash their hands that they're getting lead poisoning. I, I really think it has something to do with the environment they're working in. Uh, and you know, she was obviously just a silly woman who didn't know what she was talking about. They're dirty. They're immigrants. Uh, and she went and she was trying to convince people this is, this is a matter of class. This is a matter of class that you're not understanding. And she finally found a case study in, in Europe was doing much better on, on some of these toxin pollutants, especially lead. And there was a case study in Utah. And she said, and, and she talked to this person who, who was at one of the mills, and he said, oh, we actually don't have any cases of lead poisoning here. And as a scientist, as somebody who does research, of course, the first thing she did is she, she went to Utah and she said, I, I need to find out what you guys are doing. Is it, is it you know, respirators? What are you doing that you're, the, the folks aren't getting lead poisoning? And he looked at her, and she made this trip, and he looked at her, and he said, oh, I'm so sorry. And this, this is a direct quote um, that she talks about oftentimes. She, he said, oh, you were, I wasn't talking about the wonks and the honkies. I thought you meant white people. And at that moment, she realized this was much more than a class issue. And in environmental studies, it's very hard to separate class. In many disciplines, it's very hard to separate class from race but it has to be done. And in that moment, in the, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, she got that. And there's many environmental justice cases. Uh, population growth, when we talk about the environment and population growth, 
right? It's about, well, there's just too many people and there's not enough resources, too many people, not enough resources. It's rooted in complete and total racism if you look at Malthus and some of the stuff that he wrote. But not only way back then, in the 1970s, Paul Ehrlich, who wrote The Population Bomb, and that was what started the environmental movement. It was such a great thing in the 1970s. We had an Earth Day and it was... And I always tell my students, you have to be very, very careful when you look at population growth and you tie it to this is the problem of all the environmental causes because what you're doing is you're blaming brown people. Paul Ehrlich went to India and he said, look at these bar look at this, this is gross, this is disgusting, this is the problem. And so there's another instance, right? And the Green Movement, the, the Sierra Club in the 1970s was pulled back in the 1970s saying, should we incorporate some of these racial, environmental justice, urban toxin issues in our agenda? This is like late 1970s. The vast majority said, absolutely not. This isn't our issue. Just recently, just recently, um, we hear about this with Hispanic laborers as well. And I guess the reason why, to, to finish this up, the reason why I, I find it that I always bring it up when I'm talking about environmental issues in my class is that for many, many years, for decades, I didn't believe it myself. I grew up in a very, very low-income family. We were on food stamps. We lived in a single wide trailer. Um, I felt that I had to pull myself from the bootstraps, that I didn't believe in this idea of white privilege, that certainly I had to work really, really hard for what I had. And it wasn't until I've had, I, I went to college, I started reading books, that I noticed my own white privilege as being something very, very separate from my class, um, that even, absolutely, and, and even as a very poor young white woman, I grew up with privilege that was very different from a wealthy black woman living in another area that I never, and it's something I never had to think about my whiteness, and that's the whole point, is that that's the institutionalized part of it, is that I never have to think about it. Um, and so that's why I feel so compelled daily to bring up these issues in my environmental studies classes. It's part of the discipline, but it's also something that I've had to learn over many, many years myself. Uh, first, I just want to say how phenomenal it is um, to see this room so packed with people uh, and to thank uh, the student organizers and my colleagues for this opportunity. So I think I'm here because I'm the dean of the college. <laughs> I think that's, that's literally why I'm here. Um, but uh, I want to speak to you. Um, oh, and by the way, I am dean of the college. I'm Maud Mandel, dean of the college. <laughs> Didn't introduce myself. Um, I, I, quick, a quick three part comment. So I want to speak to you as a Jewish girl from New Jersey, and then as a professor of history at Brown University, and then as dean of the college, uh, which is a new, a new hat that I'm learning to wear. Um, so first, the Jewish girl from New Jersey. I've been wearing that hat for a long time. Um, so I grew up in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, you're going to have whatever assumptions you have about that, so I'm not going to fill in that blank for you. Um, but I was a townie in Princeton. Um, and I think what I want to say about that experience broadly around this issue um, are two really different things. One um, is everything I learned about privilege, race, um, class differences were learned in totally horrifying moments of embarrassment. Uh, and they, and I, I say that because I think many of us, no matter where we come from, when we encounter difference, uh, and realize the assumptions that we've been carrying around with us. I don't mean profound racism, that too, but I just mean really basic assumptions of what we took for granted about our own lives um, that get shaken up in moments of encounter with someone different. Uh, you know, those are profoundly important learning experiences. They can be tremendously embarrassing. Um, they, uh, are the, they are the moments, I think, that at least I can, when I speak for myself, um, allowed me to move to the next level. And so if there's you know, reason alone for the celebration of a diversity on a campus like this, is it forces all of us, whatever background we come from, to constantly encounter people who are different and to learn from those encounters, well, before we even step in the classroom. Um, and I, I've had a lifetime of those kinds of moments, sort of unlearning things that I took for granted coming from a particular racial group, ethnic group, religious group, uh, wealth background, et cetera. <coughs> 
Uh, okay, as a historian, so I'm a, my specialization is history. I'm a professor of modern Jewish history, um, so I've spent a lot of time studying and thinking about difference. The Jewish experience in the United States um, is a fascinating one for studying and thinking about both race and racism, uh, about how things can change, about how um, race is socially constructed and how, uh, how that can change over time. It's not a f fixed, and that actually gives me optimism uh, when I think about the future. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to mention here about thinking about race racism, when I teach it, what I try to talk about and think about and understand better is how people come to know what they know to be true, whatever they know to be true. So when I think about this in a historical context, for example, I teach a course on the history of the Holocaust, one of the things I really want the students to think about is not <laughs> whether or not the Nazis were evil. I think we can agree the Nazis did evil things. But I think we have to think about them as human beings, and that when they opened their eyes and they looked out of their eyes, what they knew to be true in their world, things they did not question, basic assumptions, were not driven by evil or good, right? They were driven, if you read the pamphlet coming in here, by the constructed norms that you just get living a life. And so the question then of how you unlearn those things is really fundamental, I think, to the conversation we're having. And it is not easy, right? That no one panel is going gonna, is gonna to solve those problems. These are lifetime conversations and constant um, of those embarrassing moments, right? Constantly of those, those learning moments where you're learning about difference uh, in the face of those uh, encounters. OK, lastly is the dean of the college. Um, uh, so now I find myself in a new position, right? I have um, a, a totally privileged position um, in a certain sense now, access um, in ways that I hadn't before. And one of the things um, I'm thinking about in this new role, and I hope you can help me think about it, not today, but also uh, over the next many years, and I, I, I take this from Jewish history as well, is what do we want from a diverse campus? I mean, really, what do we want? Now, let, let me, you, forgive me, Shane, I'm gonna just take an extra 30 seconds on this issue, but it's really, really important to me. So in Jewish history, one of the main things that I study, because uh, if you study Jewish history, it runs through all the literature, is assimilation. It's the question of how much did this minority change or not change in order to blend into the surrounding population? The concept of assimilation is key um, to that history. So I've thought about, a lot about assimilation. And I think for the longest time, when we think about the history of this institution and what we've heard about it, what we thought, and we, I've been here since for a long time, I think many of us, I think it was an assumption, was that it was good enough to be diverse. In other words, open the door to access, and you've, you've done it. You've fixed the problems. Over time, the pictures on the wall will change. It takes time. Change takes time, but it will change. And that, that simply, simply uh, opening the doors would solve the problem. But I think what we've never really asked was how the institution should change. In other words, if you want, if, if, if you want to include difference, Presumably you think it's important that the thing that is being joined, which itself is an organic creature, that here being Brown University, that the thing you're joining is also going to change, that something's going to change by having more women, by having more people of color, by having people of different class backgrounds, that the institution is going to change. And I don't think we ever sat down to say, how do we want it to change? What do we want the outcome to be? And so I really think in my role as dean of the college, that's one of the things I'm thinking about. But I can't do that by myself, because I'm just a Jewish girl from New Jersey. I'm just learning. And I need more input over the years from you and these kinds of conversations in order for us to think together about what it means. And again, that's not an easy, there is no easy answer to that, right? How do you want the institution to change, to reflect um, the, the things that bring diversity, that diversity brings to the institution? All right, I'm passing the mic now. So uh, what, what they said. <laughs> So um, um, uh, my name is Rick Bungiro. I am a senior lecturer in um, molecular microbiology and immunology, one of the biomed uh, departments. Um, 
I am here, well, first of all, I have to say it is a great privilege to be here at this table. Not that kind of privilege, okay? <laughs> all right, but, uh, yeah, but no, really, it's, um, I, I, I'm just looking at what I see here and, and I'm wondering why I'm here, but then I remembered I'm here because Hannah and Kaylee asked me to come. My students or stu people that will maybe become my students or represent my students, asked me to be here, and that means something to me. And um, I will say that I, um, I uh, am a native Rhode Islander. Uh, I, I learned how to pronounce my R's long ago. Um, I am basically, uh, like many Rhode Islanders, I am what could be called Gaelic and garlic. I am uh, part Irish and part Italian, uh, which basically means that I've got a white side and a whiter side, okay? <laughs> Um, and actually, I, it, it, it was kind of amusing to me uh, when I learned at some point um, in my adult life that there was a time when um, I, Italian immigrants and Irish immigrants were not considered white by other earlier arriving um, uh, populations. And so at some point, it was like, oh boy, we got to be white too, you know? And, um, you know, I, I, it, as a biologist, I, um, uh, I teach courses in, um, uh, in immunology and uh, infectious disease and vaccine science. And you wouldn't think that racial issues would necessarily be a major part of, of those subjects, but actually you don't have to look that hard to start to see that there's a history there. Um, in my office, I have, um, among the many toys that I have, if you ever come to my office, um, I have some antique uh, medical devices, one of them being a World War II era blood, direct blood transfusion um, apparatus. Um, so this would have been back in the days when you would literally lay the donor next to the recipient and, and, um, and hook them up, basically, to get the blood into the person who needs needed it. And just sort of in the last day or so, I, I looked at that and I said, you know, when that thing was made, they probably would never have thought of hooking a black man to a white man, let's say, to give a transfusion. And it sort of made me really think about sort of what the history of my own field has been. Um, you know, right now uh, with the Ebola outbreak, we are seeing um, a much greater awareness now that uh, that Ebola is coming, has come to the United States. 4,000 West Africans are already dead from this disease and thousands more will die. Um, and yet, and yet the, the, the most amazing thing is that the most poignant commentary on sort of the hypocrisy of this whole thing has been by The Onion, when a f about a month ago they said Ebola vaccine approximately 50 white people away. And, you know, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, and, and it's true, is it now that, that you know, Americans, not, they're not all of them white, but, but certainly Americans are, are getting this, that um, people are um, starting to pay attention to these, to these things. And, um, and so I, um, I, I think about these things a lot now. I think about it when I think about why um, diseases, uh, immune-mediated diseases like allergy and asthma are more prevalent in minority communities. And I think about it when I think about people who don't have access to things like life-saving vaccines. So even in my own field, I can see the effect of privilege and lack thereof. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you all so much for such thoughtful introductions. We have a few questions we're going to ask that the uh, panelists can discuss among themselves, and that's where we're going now. So how and with whom do you talk about race, and where on campus do you go to have these conversations? We should just banter about. Banter about. Anyone can start, yes. 
Um, you don't want to call on somebody. <laughs> I, I, I've, I have these conversations all the time with my students, with my advisees, um, with the students I mentor. Um, one of the PhD students I trained, Marvin Steele, was African American. Um, and uh, Marvin explained to me, uh, I remember this once very pointedly, why he really did not want to come into the laboratory in the middle of the night, even though that was necessitated by an experiment. And um, I said, well, you know, I, you know, it's a city and I'm kind of afraid. He says, no, you don't understand. Um, um, I am going to be stopped. I am going to be asked for my ID. I am going to be treated skeptically on this sort of stuff. And um, it got to the point, and this is in, I want to spar from my lab, but late 80s, early 90s, um, where in an era when students and faculty did not take their IDs and put them on hang tags, Marvin did. Um, precisely because this happened to him so often. So we had many conversations about that. Um, and I've also had you know, a, a, a very, lar very large number of advisees for whom this has been an issue. Um, and they'll come to me and say, um, and I think uh, Professor Kennedy said this, they don't feel at home here. Mm -hmm. And you know, my quick response is, white guy can't help you specifically with the race issue, but I can tell you how out of place I felt at this place as a public school kid uh, suddenly surrounded by private school kids, as uh, someone who was asked when the first winter break came up, uh, where are you going, Florida, Bermuda, Mexico? And the answer is no, I'm going home for a part-time job to work in a factory because I need spending money in the spring semester. And that cultural dissonance is different from what the whole racial issue looks like. Uh, but it gave me a basis, and it continues to give me a basis, to talk with my students about this, and actually with my colleagues as well, in terms of people in my own department. And I find these conversations can happen anywhere on this campus. They don't happen enough, um, but they can and they should happen anywhere. Thank you. So <clears throat> one of the things uh, I'm struck by is that it is easy and incumbent upon everyone to have conversations about all forms of exclusion whenever we see them, whenever we can address them. But that, to me, is only the start of the conversation. Because one of the things that sociologists will typically focus on is that it's not just a matter of what you have in your head, not just a matter of your individual values, it's the way institutions work, it's the way structures work. And so one of the things that I'm struck by is that I'm often in conversations now not only about how individuals feel, but how the, the institution reproduces its whiteness. What are the rules and what are the resources that enable the institution to reproduce whiteness? We can see that and we talk about it all the time when we think about faculty hires. And we have guidelines, ever better guidelines, about how to treat diversity in our faculty priorities. But they could be better. But what can clearly be better is the sophistication and the awareness of the conversation around those faculty hires. So for instance, one of the things we have done in the sociology department is not just to talk about it among the faculty, but to establish a diversity committee made up of both faculty and graduate students in order to talk about the obstacles and opportunities that occur around faculty hires. That was not by any means the completion of the story, but it provided a mechanism for better conversations to take place. And now I would say that one of the things that I find most productive is an informal group organized in light of the power, I would say, of the May 2014 Ray Kelly incident, quote unquote, report and to talk about what that report means and what lessons we could draw for how the university might respond ever more effectively. Of course, I respect the president's report, but I think the president's report response invites creative action to move it ahead. And that's what I take as the invitation. 
that motivates my own conversation. One more, and since I direct the Women's Center, I have gender in my mind too, so <laughs> to balance out maybe some of the. Okay, uh, so I'll say something because I was thinking about this question, and when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking, well, I have these conversations a lot. I have them with students, I have them with colleagues, and I have them in a lot of spaces on campus. And then I started to think about the fact that in my position, I also have power and privilege, and that gives me access to spaces, and that I have to be thinking about not just which conversations do I open up, but which conversations do I close down, or which conversations do I affect when I enter into them. So just to say, as we're thinking about where do we have these conversations, what's our impact on those conversations and being aware of what even the access to, to different spaces and different opportunities means. Great, thank you very much. Now the next question is, and we'll take two or three, how do you educate yourself about the particular experiences of various racial and ethnic groups so that we can ensure that the voices of students of color are elevated to the center of the conversation? Uh, I'll just say, I mean, I feel like I said this in my opening remarks, but I think the, the by far the best education comes through in encounter and personal conversation. Um, it is slow, hard work, right? Um, and as a scholar, I'd like to say that some of that education comes from reading and thinking as well, and it certainly does. Uh, but most, I think most people uh, don't start to read about something that they haven't already encountered uh, as a problem or an interest in some other part of their life. And I think most of that learning comes from um, encounter. It, that creates a difficulty, I think, because uh, the issue came up before about um, how individuals sort of become stand-ins for whole racial or ethnic or religious uh, or gendered groups, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and that's a risk when leaning so heavily on conversation and interaction as a way uh, of educating. But I do think it is probably the, the space where we learn the most. Ah, <clears throat> very short. I, God gave us two ears, one mouth for a reason, and I think you learn a lot by listening. <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay. so thank you for the comments. <laughs> now, what are the ways in which you hold yourself and your colleagues accountable for, racial, for furthering racial justice on campus, and not just through your, act, through your actions, but not just mindsets, and how do you know when you are being successful at that? So um, in, um, in my teaching, uh, uh, we've started having um, more conversations in, uh, in the vaccine science class about some of the, um, the, 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 the racial issues that may be involved in people's attitudes towards, um, towards uh, vaccines, uh, medical care in general, um, and also sort of priorita priorities of, um, let's say, pharmaceutical uh, um, companies, let's say, that are developing um, certain medications that might be more marketable to, well, let's face it, old fat white guys, right? Um, so I sort of, I tend to call out certain things that I see in my field. I, I, I don't necessarily, you know, personally direct these these things but I you know, towards particular persons but I sort of I sort of try to call out what I see as um, uh, injustice or or inequalities in in fields that I that I care about um, and you know this this is I, I think I could say that I know that it's working when we spend a, in a, even in a fairly decent sized lecture class, we actually will then spend 15 minutes talking about racial issues that impact access to things like vaccines. It's a completely unscripted discussion. It, it really is contributed to by multiple people in the course um, of, of all different backgrounds. So when I see that sort of conversation start to happen, I, I know that there's an appetite for that type of 
conversation, even in a biology class. So, you know, I'm not a sociologist. I'm not, I don't have the qualifications that all of these amazing people have, but even I can start to have those conversations with my students. And to be honest, most of the profound comments are not by me, they're by you. So, so if, if I can say, uh, one of the things that I think this conversation invites is for us to focus even more on whiteness than on racial and ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by this is that obviously I'm going to be learning a lot from people of color, obviously. But one of the things that I'm struck by is the privilege and challenge of being an anti-racist white and what that means. And I'll just mention two examples of this. First, at an individual level, it's really easy to see it because in the classes I teach, it happens in almost every single class where a person of color will make a point and then a white person will say, well, you know, I've suffered something similar. <laughs> And you know, actually, it's very hard for me because I'm, just a, I'm a student just like you. And I hear this all the time. And so if I hear it all the time, my white privilege is, involves hard, hardness of hearing around this. I know people of color hear this way more than I do. Right? So the first thing that I do is to say, mm. <laughs> The second thing I do is I say, you know what? I have often been in your circumstance. But I think you're missing something. And then I go on to explain the difference between just being another student and being a student of color versus those with white privilege. But the second point, I, for me, is the more important point, is that we can do things individually, and that matters. That's ethical. But we need to do things collectively to be consequential. And so the conversations that matter, for me, are not the ones that happen on the one-offs. The conversations, for me, are the ones that involve serious and sustained thinking, not only about what's wrong, but how to make it right. Not just by adjusting the rules, but by changing our practices. And that can be done. Wanna, all right, I can, I'll say what I was gonna say. I, I, um, I thought that was such a profound statement, I thought I was gonna let it rest. But um, <laughs> since you're, since you're uh, gesturing to me, Shane, I was just going to speak, just say one um, very brief point, which is um, ever an optimist. Um, while we, I know we have tremendous struggles on this campus and um, in our society, uh, I think this conversation, this room, is a, uh, a sign of our success. I mean, if we are trying to measure how, if we're making progress, the fact that we can have this conversation, however difficult and however frustrated you are by it, or angry, or inspired, or optimistic, or pessimistic, whatever view you are, you come away from this conversation with, we would not have been able to do this five years ago. Certainly, when I was at Michigan years and years ago, we, were, we talked about race, we talked about racism. It's, you know, it's, it wasn't a, there, it's not like everything has just started, but the, the momentum of this kind of transformative conversation that, uh, that you all are willing to participate in and that my colleagues are willing to participate in, I think that is a sign of some kind of success. Does that mean we've reached an end point? Absolutely not. It's the beginning, middle, and maybe, you know, I hope never an end in some ways because you always want to keep working to make society a more just space for everyone. Professor King? Yes. Um, we had a chance to look at some of these questions ahead of time, and this one was really hard because I, I don't know if I'm being successful. It's, it's a really difficult question to answer, and I can guarantee you in order, for me to, in order for us to be successful, most of the people who need to be here are absolutely not here. Um, and so it's, it's not you, it's not you. Um, 
And so I, I'm speaking at you, and I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. And oftentimes, especially at Brown, um, and I actually had um, at, a, at a, a very white Bethlehem teaching at a college there for a while, um, white male students approach me and actually challenge me and stand up and say, well, wait a second, that's, you know, it's, it, you know, I have problems too, just like you were saying. But I don't hear it at Brown. And I think there, I know there's, there, there are, and not just white men, anybody, when I, when I talk about these issues, I know there are people rolling their eyes in their back of their heads. I know there are. And they're not speaking up because it's not really socially acceptable right now to do that. But they're talking amongst themselves and they talk on blogs and they talk in chat. And what, 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 really, what really disturbs me is that there's new kind of racism now. And there was a great NPR story the other day and it was about, um, she was actually an Indian woman and I think she's now at Harvard, but she was teaching at Yale at the time. And she was a crocheter. And I don't know how many of you have heard this story. I think she's written a book about it now. Um, she's a crocheter, and she's an a, a, a MD or a, a, like a PhD in biology or something like that. And she hurt her hand. And she went into the emergency room, and the, the surgeon came, and uh, she said, you know, I, I need my hands. I'm a crocheter and knitter, and it's really important to me. And he said, yeah, of, co of course it is, of course it is. And he kind of sends her down the line. And at one moment, he realized that she was a professor at Yale. And she said, everything changed at that moment. I, I had a hand surgeon there, a, a wonderful hand surgeon there. And, the, and to her, and she was an Indian woman, she said, oh, racism has shifted. And it's a very difficult racism to put your finger on because it's not that of, I don't like you, or, I don't like your kind. It's that, I just want to help people like me up. Right? And what's so bad about that? I'm just being kind. I'm just, and I struggle with this myself. I get, we, in environmental studies, we get so excited when there's a woman who wants to get into the sciences or math or physics. Um, I think Brown is an institution, most institutions are very, and then we get even more excited when she's a woman of color. And I think, well, am I as a woman doing this exact same thing? Is it fair for me um, to reach down my hand and say, I want to help you? I want to help a fellow woman. Um, I want to help a fellow scholar. And so, I think, you know, and we see this with the anonymous CVs now. Have you heard of some of these stories with businesses who black out all names, who black out whether they can't tell what your ethnicity is, they can't tell if you're, and all of a sudden they're starting to hire a lot of different people. And to hear those who are doing this process saying, but I'm a good guy, I was never racist, I never purposely, we hired the right people, I'm positive. We hired the right people. And they just happen to be a lot of white males. <laughs> And I mean, I, I think he was being honest though, and that's the problem. He honestly thought he was, we're just hiring the right people for the job until they blacked out those names and they started all of a sudden, women, minorities. And that was his aha moment of, oh. And so I, I, I think, I don't know when I'm being successful. I don't, I don't know when this happens because it's so hard, it's, it's, it's so nuanced now. And it's just as bad, if not worse, um, to, to pull up those who are like you instead of being more out there. I mean, at least that's out there. At least I've had students at other universities say, well, I don't agree with it, and this is why. Great, at least that's being honest. Um, and so I feel like the real conversation here at Brown is, we need to get the people who aren't in this room right now in this conversation, and th I think that's the real challenge. Thank you. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so we're going to open up for questions. We had you write questions down, but we changed our minds. So there are mics on either side, so if you want to line up to ask questions, make sure that your questions aren't longer than 15 minutes, um, because we've heard those questions at Brown before. So, um, so just make sure you're pretty succinct and get to the point of what you want to say. Will. <laughs> that I'd like the panel to talk about a little bit, this idea of like um, sort of success and like merits and like sort of rewarding people to like, you know, like the black and white names on like a resume, right? Um, and I think like that's a really good initiative, right? I think it's really great that folks are able to succeed um, when they do have, so like, let's talk about like, okay, so, so I think that's really great. But at the same time, I don't think it recognizes the way that there are like structural barriers to people succeeding in a lot of ways, and I don't think it recognizes the way that like housing or like neighborhoods or education um, are all impacted by the ways that people are like labeled and identified by society. So like while I think that's a good initiative, I'd like for folks to talk a little bit more about the ways that identity is implicated in these systems um, beyond sort of like prejudices, like micro prejudices or like interpersonal prejudices between people. Can we take one or two? I'm 
going to boil down your question to the way on which I heard it, which is, how do we solve all of our problems in society? Um, because essentially, you know, what you're talking about are uh, the, 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 the fact that there are superficial ways to sort of abolish certain kinds of prejudice or to negate certain kinds of advantage by blacking out the resume and that sort of stuff. I could as well say that I do away with uh, any aspect of privilege or prejudice in the courses I teach because I black out the student names when I grade an exam. So everybody is graded the same, so everything's okay. But it's also true that people don't come into my course or any other course or Brown um, from the equal starting line. And that's very clear. So you're asking the deeper question of how do we go back and how do we solve that? And I think you know the, the answer is simple, but the answer is also unbelievably difficult and complex, which is we do everything we can every day to work for a race just society. Um, and that is incumbent upon everyone. It's especially incumbent upon what is called in the jargon the privileged group. And I'm going to say something that I've been, I, I'm not worried, but I've been wondering whether or not I should say it or not. So I'm going to say it um, because I'm going to assume that we're at a place where not just uh, ethnic diversity, but intellectual diversity is welcome as well. And that is that. I'm going to start out by saying that white privilege is absolutely real. And anyone who doesn't recognize that it exists doesn't have their eyes open. Um, it's very, very clear. And there are many ways in which white privilege is delineated in this little handout. These are all things here. But when I look at these things, I wonder sometimes, should these be called privilege? For example, uh, you can have arrived late to a class without it being attributed to your race. You can find someone in a position of power, same skin color as you. You can have political opinions of any kind without it being attributed to your race. To me, the word privilege means something over and above what most people are supposed to have. To me, everything I just mentioned is something that everybody should have. And therefore, I think, in effect, we're not talking about doing away with white privilege. What we're really talking about is extending these things we are calling privileges to every single person in society and every person on this campus. And therefore, I think sometimes the use of that word promotes a backlash among white people for the simple reason that it implies you're getting something you ought not to have because of being a member of this group. And it's hard to make that argument to someone who really doesn't have the privilege of attending an Ivy League school, um, an advisee of mine who has to go home to a single uh, drug-addicted mother and her abusive boyfriend say, you got privilege, man. What we're really talking about is those privileges are things that it should extend to everybody and clearly don't on the basis of skin color. And that's what basically has to be solved in the society. And it's something this country has always been, uh, 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 been afflicted with since its very roots. It still is. And it's something that it's incumbent upon all of us to try to solve. <laughs> we'll take so I'm just curious as to like how that happens, right? Like, so. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, and like all that happens at Brown, right? So like I know that I know that these are things are problems, but how does like what is the work that students? What is what are the policies? What are the sort of things um, that people need to do on this campus to make sure that happens beyond sort of just having conversations in limited spaces like this? Beyond sort of talking about these issues, beyond the naming of privilege, what does that look like in policies, in like institutions, in hiring practices, and those sorts of things? I, I, I'm going to argue that what one should do. Oh, excuse me, if I may to, interject. Oh, I want to make sure that the other panelists also oh, have sure. opportunity to comment. Mm -hmm. let, let me just say something very quickly. Oh, wait. Um, uh, oh okay. <laughs> so, um, Maude and then just, can, or I, In some ways, I want to throw the question back to you um, by saying if that was if those were, if that was an easy question that people on a panel could spit up, people of goodwill who deeply want to fight racism and believe in a just and equal society, which I think I can say all of the people on the panel do, if we had that simple answer, it would, have, it would have been enacted, right? So I think these are incredibly complex problems. Uh, and there's the larger question of sort of society, the United States from all time, for all time, um, brown uh, individuals, right? So at what kind of level and what kind of, what is the problem you're trying to solve? So for example, if the problem you're trying to solve is more people of color on the staff and the faculty, there are policies we've been working on 
we've made significant progress. We haven't made enough progress. We continue to work at that. It's a challenge for all kinds of reasons, some because of lack of goodwill, but sometimes it, that's not even the problem, right? It goes back to those other problems, that there are structural inequities that create um, pipeline issues, right? So there are all kinds of things um, that are difficult, and each one of them requires their own s solutions uh, and, um, and people sort of directing and focusing their attention on them. And so it's, we, you know, we rely on the community also to tell us you know, where those particular points of um, tension really are and where we can focus our best, our best efforts. But I think at least up until recent years, most of the efforts have been focused on this thing that we've called diversity. That's what we've been doing for a really long time, for better or worse. It's worked to a certain degree, right? The campus used to have two African-American students, and we are a far more diverse place. We have had significant success in something called diversity. The faculty level, a little bit less so, but it's still a much more diverse faculty than it used to be, relative, and we have to keep working. The question now is, and this will be the last thing, is if we want to shift the conversation to privilege. That's really what came out of the Kelly report, and that takes you in a slightly different direction and may bring you to different solutions. But we're just, I think, at the beginning of trying to figure out, and that's why I talked about assimilation. We don't necessarily want to bring everybody here just to make everybody the way a graduate of Brown in 1967 would have looked like, right? We bring in different kinds of people, which means we want to presumably produce different kinds of people. But how and what does that mean? And I think that's the work we're trying to do now. Thank you. And that's it. So, oh. Anyway, so my question is Professor King talked about how we get other people in the room who are not in the room right now. And so I'm wondering all of you guys on the panel who are deans and professors and your spheres of influences like classrooms, how can you make this a part of your everyday classroom experience? And Professor Benjiro talked about uh, making that a part of biology, which is great. But for those of you on the panel, like how can you make this a part of your classrooms? And if you don't have an answer right now, maybe my challenge to you is how can you do that in the future so that every class that you touch at least, has, you're able to raise people's consciousness on this issue. I can. I, I, I obviously I, do, I don't know the answer to that question, but one thing I could say, and it's 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 going off of what was just said, is that it, opening doors is not the answer. But creating a more diverse student population, I think, helps with the answer. And what I do hope, and when I say I don't, I don't know if I'm making a difference, um, I hope that there's one or two, two students that I have um, that through diversity, and what we are learning is that diverse backgrounds are a wonderful thing for problem solving, whether you're Jewish or Catholic or male or female or black or white. Every, every single one of us comes from a different background, different perceptions. And I hope in my class when we talk about skill building and problem solving is that some of my students see, oh, that's, that's a really interesting way of approaching that problem. I, I never would have thought of that. Well, of course you never would have thought of that because this person comes from New Jersey and this person uh, you know, has a certain background that you don't. And so I guess part of the solution is diversity. It's not the answer. But part of the sol solution is getting people to talk to each other and, and hopefully uh, being able to help them come to some of those conclusions that diverse groups uh, are just better problem solvers and that that's what we need in this world right now. And you're going to go out to the job market and you're going to go uh, hopefully try to solve big issues. And what we need is diversity and not just racial diversity, but also world diversity. Um, wow, we should really be listening to less developed countries and maybe they have something to say about how we need to develop and how we need to solve climate change and, and issues of that. So it, it's bringing in all sorts of different voices. and. Hopefully somewhere, uh, my students realize that that's a very important component. Thank you. And then we have time for one last question. Um, so thank you if you wanted to provide one. Um, and then we're going to have the panelists give closing remarks. Mm -hmm. My name is May. I'm a sophomore. And my question um, to all the panelists is that a lot of you have acknowledged the fact that you came into critical consciousness or awareness of your white privilege through either being educated or coming from a rich background. And I was, uh, I wanted to touch upon the idea of these critical consciousnesses being inaccessible to people of low socioeconomic status and who don't, uh, like, who don't have access to higher education. And I just want to know, what are you doing as, um, like, mo as uh, people in, that represent the Brown institutions in actively um, 
in actively working against the exclusivity of these critical conscious uh, dialogues mm -hmm. in academia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, last question. <laughs> so that's a really good question. <laughs> um, because I, at, you know, there are times when I sort of, you know, I, I, in this amazing bubble, membrane, whatever you want to call it, I sometimes get frustrated because I know that the rest of society isn't like this in many ways. And, and so um, that is, I think, just acknowledging that, um, that, that, yes, there are a lot of people who don't have the ability, and at least the way to come to some of these realizations that many of us have had by being in a room like this. I mean, think about it. There are people, millions upon millions of people in this country who have never been in a room with this kind of diversity. And I really want them to have that experience, but I have to admit, your question is a really good one that I personally, I don't know what the answer is, but I know we have to do something. And, and um, you know, I'm just curious as to what more educated folks think about that well, than me, I should I'll, say. I'll, 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 I'm not as a more educated folk, but as somebody who's <laughs> willing to say a couple of things about that, because I do think it's a really good question that requires our careful attention. And something that I was really conscious of writing my narrative, because that was my lens and that has been my experience, and most of my work has been on college or university campus. But I think I would think about two things, and one is that, it, and this was going to be part of my what's my ideal image of Brown, is really going to be about access to Brown. Brown. So, right, keep continuing to make sure, and this also goes to Will's question really about how are we thinking about structural racism and our responsibility. We have to do everything. It's really about every policy and every practice we have at this university and taking a look at it. But so certainly one commitment is going to be increasing access here, and then the other thing is going to be our engagement outside of these walls. And one of the things that I think is really important about some of the work we're trying to do now is to also give you opportunities to, where we're helping you make some of the connections between the work you're doing in the world, and some of that comes through the work that we get to do in the world outside of the university, but helping to make some of those connections to what you're learning and give you some of the skills and tools so that you can, can take some of this work in ways that we've found opportunities in our own lives also to take this work outside of the university walls, but we're really trying to build that into what we're doing. So I think it's part of our, our commitment to the university has to be getting more people here and making that possible and what we can take out from this learning that you are privileged to have access to and that we're privileged to have access to and making sure that we're taking that to other places and I know lots of you have commitments in the community lots of us have commitments in the community where we're doing some of that so that'd be a start to some of what you're asking about thank you so I just want to acknowledge that it's 730 and we do want to provide time for the panelists to give very brief <laughs> <laughs> final remarks so we will Start over there and then work our way over. So um, thank you for all of you for being, for inviting us, for being here. Um, this is important and it's just a beginning. And I will challenge you as I challenge myself. Um, let's keep this conversation going. Let's find some other ways for us to have this conversation. As difficult as it may be, as uncomfortable as it may be for some people, I think we'll, we'll together we'll start to move past some of that discomfort. And um, I think that based on what I've seen tonight, I think that we can, we can do this. We can. I hate conclusions. I, I, hate writing, I hate writing them for my books and summing up the last day of class um, because it always strikes me as far too pat and simplistic for really complex problems. So I don't have any closing remarks. Um, but what I would say is I have an inbox. Um, and at the risk of um, regretting it, uh, <laughs> uh, I would um, welcome ongoing conversations in one form or another. Can't promise every email will get a response, but I can promise I have open office hours. I would love to talk to you further uh, about your um, visions for this university and, um, and good ideas. That's really what I'd love to talk about. 
Um, yeah, my inbox is broken. Um, all right. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened. Um, <laughs> that's so weird, I didn't get back to you. Um, no, it definitely works, it's always full. Um, I think one thing, maybe just to, to address that last question and maybe a, a plug for Brown is that we're, I feel I'm in a, a very empowered position, we all are, um, to, to have the jobs that we do and to be active, I think most of us are active members in the community, and a, and a plug for the engaged scholarship that, that Brown is embarking on, um, because that is a way, I mean, I, I, I see students go out in the community and it's not about teaching, I hope at least my students, it's not about we're coming in to teach you something, it's about Brown students learning from members of the community. Uh, one such example, I work oftentimes with the African Alliance, and these are uh, refugee women who feel really stupid because they don't speak English, yet they speak five other languages fluently. And to come in and say, well, this is how you do market, you know, this is how, and this is, you know, supply and demand and things like that, is to take a breath and stop and realize what you can learn from these women. You know, ask her about that herb. She could tell you a hundred things that you didn't know about that um, that are all very true. And so I think that is a way for us to get outside. Um, I think Brown has done an excellent job of, 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 of pushing this momentum forward with engaged scholarship and to challenge you all, and I, I challenge myself on a daily basis um, to get out of this wonderful, warm bubble of Brown University um, and to embrace your community and not just to go and educate, but to learn from your community. <laughs> I, I, I had two comments. One, I'm, uh, let's put it this way, I'm, I'm worried about my colleagues, so what they're gonna think if we start talking about uh, questions of race and ethnicity when it's not directly part of the course syllabus and, and uh, you know, what, what exactly the students own to the faculty. I think the other I issue is a role the faculty can have in inspiring people to want to take on these kinds of things, to answer this question about how you're going to transform uh, the rest of the world. I think it's people like you are going to go out and do it. And, and it seems to me it's the role of the faculty to inspire people to go out and do it. <laughs> When, when someone out in the real world, I mean, one of my neighbors, uh, someone that I, someone I know because of my work as a sports official or something like that, asks me, what do I do? I tell them, and then I say I have the best job in the world. And it's not just because it's a great school. It's not just because the opportunities it affords me, but because I never set foot on this campus without feeling as though I am challenged by the community here and by my students. And I think the kinds of challenges that we hear uh, in a panel like this, in a discussion like this, and the questions that you have asked, uh, is uh, these challenges are what make this an exciting community and a productive community. And I think ultimately it's voices speaking up and posing these challenges that are gonna move us towards a solution to this problem and towards establishing a campus uh, which can be and I hope and I pray will be at some point a model for racial justice uh, and for opportunity for all of our students and every member of the community. Thanks. So um, we are in a room that some of us were in very memorably almost exactly a year ago. <laughs> and we are having a conversation. We, have, we still have a lot of work to do. There's no question about that. But we are having a conversation that we might not even have had a year ago. So I just want to recognize that we're embarking on some of the work that it's clear that we need to do. And that's a good place to be in, and that's an exciting moment. And um, I'm really appreciative that we've had the kinds of conversations we've had on this campus this fall about Ferguson, Missouri, about Israel, Gaza, about white privilege. And I hope that these conversations continue and flourish, because then we're doing the work that we need to do as this university. So I, I'm appreciative to be here today. I love going first and love going last. <laughs> so, I want to embrace the challenge of the question from the back. What's your name, sir, again? Will. Will. I want to embrace Will's question. But I want to embrace it in a way that makes it manageable and consequential. So how do we think about the link between the individual justice of a blacked out CV and the larger justice that we seek in the reconstruction of society? We can see it, I think, on campus. <clears throat> First, there are small changes that we could make to make these conversations more common. 
What if we were to have a large and regular course on the sociology of the university in which one of the questions is, how is whiteness reproduced? That would be a real simple solution, a simple step forward. Two, what would happen after all, I'm associated as well with the Watson Institute for International Studies. And I know what terrific consequence having an endowment of that size has for the quality of the conversation, the number of faculty, and the priority within the university that kind of endowment has. I would like to volunteer now to work with anybody to raise an endowment that would make a center for the study of race and ethnicity in America, not just a small bunch of rooms, however consequential that group is, but to have an endowment the size of Watson and the influence of Watson on campus. Three. The invitation and the challenge to think about the university's responsibility to its environs, to its public, is huge. I was at a public university, so it was assumed that the university was a citizen. When I came to Brown, I didn't realize that this was philanthropy. Mm. <laughs> I would love to see another center, another institute at Brown equally dedicated to the relationship between Brown and Providence. And in these three steps, with that kind of goal in mind, we could imagine a transformative conversation, not only in terms of how we change each other's minds, but how we can alter the rules and resources of our institution. So Dean Kogi and I would like to thank, especially the audience members, so thank you all very much. You definitely are owed an applause. Feel free to applause. <laughs> applaud. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much to our panelists for sharing remarks. And thank you to Hannah and Kaylee for coordinating this awesome event. Mm -hmm. And thank you to my co-moderator. Yeah. And mine. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And we have pizza. I can't help but tell you my wife. Yes. So, let's, so let's get ready to eat and continue to be challenged and engage in dialogue because this work of anti-racism is active and a continuing process. Thank you. Absolutely.